I have a friend who is a retired colonel from the Marine Corps, disabled, and he spends his summers working as a park ranger in the national parks. Over the years, he's done many, many parks, but he finally settled on one in particular. He said, okay, this is the where I'm going to spend the rest of my summers, and that is Teton National Park. So today, we're going to find out why the Teton National Park in Wyoming is so impressive and has captured Gary's heart. Welcome to the Active Travel Adventures Podcast. I'm your host, Kit Parks. My goal and my mission is to inspire and empower you to see some of the tremendous adventure opportunities that we have around the world. Today, we're heading to Northwest Wyoming to Teton National Park. This is outside of Jackson Hole, which is a really cool town and actually probably the prettiest airport I've ever been in. And it's part of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. It's got pristine conditions throughout and some of the same species that have been around there since prehistoric times. What's cool about the Tetons, and you'll hear from Lorna, who you may recognize from Olympic National Park, is that you're out in the striking plains. It's flat, 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 and then just jutting out of nowhere are these massive 10,000-foot peaks. It's amazing. There's over 200 miles of hiking trails. There's biking, horseback riding, kayaking, paddling down the rivers. There's tons and tons of fun. So let's get started. We first met Lorna back in episode number 26 on Olympic National Park, and she's been to a ton of national parks. But for those that may not have heard that episode, Lorna, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Lorna, and I grew up going to the Tetons with my family. We went out there for family vacations to visit one of my dad's cousins. And so from a very young age, we've I've hiked the easy trails, and as I got older, I got to go to the harder trails, and it's just been a place that every time I go there, there's something new to try and something new to see, and I love visiting there, and I love taking people there to visit. But now, when we first met, and we met outside of Glacier National Park, you had been on a walkabout and had gone to loads of the national parks and monuments and all that, so you have a basis of comparison. What makes the Grand Tetons and the Teton National Park so special for the visitor that's not going there with the historical memories that you have, the family memories of what makes them say, oh man, I got to go to this park. One of my favorite things is how the Tetons were developed was with plate tectonics. There's a uh, one plate that slips underneath the other. So you have this very flat kind of open valley area and then just boom, there's 12,000 feet mountains in front of you. So it's a very dramatic view all the time because there's nothing impeding your view of the mountains. And it's just a unique formation that I think most people, when I bring them out there, it's the wow factor of you just all of a sudden you come over this little hill and it's boom, there's just these giant mountains there that you're not expecting. So it's just stunning. You can stand there and look at them for hours because there's so much detail and it's a really long range. It's about 50 miles from north to south in the park. And no matter where you stand, it's a beautiful view. Yeah, and it is striking. I remember when I was out with Venti, because she lives in Jackson Hole, which is the access town pretty much for the park. And it literally is like a flat plain. And then boom, there are the mountains. It's so cool. Very different than my North Carolina mountains, where you have the rolling hills before you get to the middle mountains, and then you get to the tall mountains. So it's quite striking, as you said. So there's lots of things to do there and to see. We're both hikers. You want to tell us a little bit about the hiking activities there, some of the trails? Sure. The Grand Tetons are great because there's a lot of little lakes at the foot of the mountain. So there's lots of options. If you're not great at doing a lot of uphill stuff, you can hike around all these little ponds and all to out to all these little points out on Jackson Lake. And they're very flat and they're very easy to do. Jenny Lake has been doing some improvements on their Lakeshore Trail. And we had a couple people with us the last time I was out there and they couldn't walk very well. Well, they were completely entertained for hours while we ran up into Cascade Canyon because the trail was so nice and so flat. They were able to handle walking on that trail. So there's lots of stuff down in the valley around the lakes. And then Every canyon that you go up into the mountains, there's multiple ones. There's granite, there's death, there's cascade, there's paintbrush. Every one of those canyons that you go up into the mountains in, it's these beautiful sheer cliffs and just uh, stunning views all the way through. So you and you can do really harder, a lot harder stuff. There's a great hike that goes up Paintbrush Canyon plus 
past Holly Lake, and then you can go up over top of the pass, and then you come down by Lake Solitude, and that gets into a little bit more technical climbing, and you might want to bring an ice axe or um, something that you can walk on snow and ice with on your feet, so like crampons. So there's really a variety of you can do the simple stuff down by the lakes and enjoy the view, or you can actually get up into the mountains, or you can go up to Garnet Canyon. And if you're a climber, go up into Garnet Canyon and go enjoy yourself. So it's just the v- variety of physical activities that you can do that I really like about this place. And I know because it does go straight up, do you have the choice only of easy or hard, or is there some medium trails as well? Oh, no, no. There's medium trails. There's a trail that goes over by Phelps Lake that it starts off fairly easy and then you go up to this climb and you look down onto the lake. So going up and down that hill over by Phelps Lake can be strenuous. It's great to wear the energy out of young kids, which is why my parents, I think, brought me out there. You know, wear the kids out walking uphill. We had our picnic lunch at the top and then we came back down. There are things in between. You can also, in addition to day hiking, you can also do some backcountry and backpacking in there as well. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? The backcountry options are amazing. There's a a shelf that runs the Teton Crest Trail, runs at the higher elevations. There's tons of backcountry there. And I did a little bit of backcountry in uh, Death Canyon with my cousins a couple of years ago. And it was inexpensive. The permits weren't crazy. The hard ones to get are the ones that go from paintbrush and over to Cascade and back. Those you have to get tried and reserve usually at least six to eight months in advance. But most of the other stuff you can get permits on pretty easy. And we should make note, too, because the park is so popular, almost everything is permitted. Whether you're using a kayak, you need a permit for that. So they aren't expensive, but they're trying to, I guess, do crowd control by permitting, I'm guessing. Yeah, probably. It's getting more and more popular. And if you don't have your own boat along, there's also Leaks Marina. You can go down to Leaks Marina or go down to Coulter Bay and rent canoes or outboard engine boats like John Boats. And you can just go out and tootle on the lake for a little while if you want to. I did that one year with my brother and really enjoyed that. I've researched said that there are 10 different lakes, but only one or two of them, they allow motorized boats. All the rest of them are only human powered boats. So you'll have the quiet and none of the lakes do they allow those jet skis, which are noisy. So I really like that a lot. Sorry to the jet ski owners, but they're obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> Any other things about hiking that you'd like to tell us about? It's really pretty beautiful. The Probably the most popular place to hike is at Jenny Lake and up Cascade Canyon. They've been doing a lot of work over at Inspiration Point. And I think that construction on that trail up to Inspiration Point has been going on for a couple of years. So also make sure if you're planning a trip, there's areas that get closed for construction, like Inspiration Point has been. They're also closing areas for animals. So if you go up into Cascade Canyon, there's a particular section that's closed off because there's peregrine falcons that are nesting there. So different times of year, you will have different areas where you do have some trail closures due to animals. So just make sure if you pick a hike, make sure you know whether or not those trails are closed for animals or for construction. Right. And they have six different ranger slash visitor centers and information centers. So, and, and a great website. So it's readily accessible to know what the situation is there. And I saw in in one of the trails, they close from November, I think to the beginning of May because of elk migration or something. So that's kind of cool because, and let's talk about elks. There's lots of wildlife there too. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's, The Tetons are one of my favorite places to see big animals like elk and bison. Just about every evening, you can go out to the northern part of Antelope Flats. So it's kind of from like the Moran entrance down to Triangle X. There's a really nice area through there that no matter what night it is, it seems like if you drive that little section on Highway 191, you always will see a herd of elk and you will always see a herd of bison. Right. And down by the water, it looks like you can see otters, osprey, bald eagles, the moose and the elk. Everybody has to come for a drink. And of course, the predatory birds like to get the fish. And there's also great fishing there, too. Some great trout fishing. Oh, yes, definitely. So fly fishing. In fact, when I was out there with Venti, who is my friend that I met you at Glacier National Park, she lives in Jackson Hole, the adjoining town. And I was getting some fly fishing lessons in the campground. It was kind of cool. Yeah, I enjoy fly fishing. I've never done it in the Tetons, but I do enjoy that. But there's other areas. 
that are out there kind of on, I call it the outer loop, which is the main highway that's out just on the outskirts. It's farther out from the mountain range. On that outer loop, there's some really great places to stop too. Like we stopped at Schaubacher's Landing just to grab some pictures. It's kind of a famous area where they take pictures and there was a moose down there. Like a lot of people like to go out to Oxbow Bend. There's a lot of times you'll see moose out at Oxbow Bend when if you go out to take photographs. So there's a lot of big animals. I've seen some big bull elks up close. I've seen a lot of moose up close. I've seen several bears, thankfully not as close as some of the other animals. So do you get to see lots of bears? Yep, all the time. And like we like to stay up at Coulter Bay and the cabins up at Coulter Bay. And they basically have a resident black bear. And she's one of the more successful black bears in the area for raising cubs. But the reason she's frequents that area is because the grizzlies don't like the noise of the people. So she's kind of acclimated herself to the crowds of Coulter Bay. But be aware that there are going to be bears around you if you are in the Tetons and always carry your bear spray. And I just did an episode on the new Adventure Travel Show podcast, episode number five on bear safety, how to hike safely in bear country. So I encourage you to check that out. I'll put a link in the show notes and on the webpage for this show. And it's a treat to see a bear, but you just want to see it from a respectful distance and don't make any animals in particularly nervous. If they start changing their behavior, you're getting too close. And there are certain guidelines that I'll put in the show notes and on the website of how far is considered a safe distance to get near the wildlife so you can enjoy them, but without ruining their natural behaviors. They also have, according to my research, the pronghorn antelope, which is the fastest mammal in North America. Have you ever seen one of those? I didn't even know we had anything like that. Are they common? Oh, yeah. They're very common. There's in the area that's kind of on the inner loop. And then between the inner loop and the outer loop, there's a flatter grassland area where the Snake River goes through. And you see them out in those. They're more of an open area kind of animal. And so you'll just be driving along and they're like, oh, yep, there's another pronghorn. There's another pronghorn. (laughs) They're abundant in the area. They don't travel in herds quite like the bison and the elk do out there by Triangle X. And another good way to see the wildlife is by floating down the Snake River. And it's not, from what I understand, there's not the big rapid. It's more like a calm, scenic river. Have you ever done any rafting or do you talk about that? Absolutely. I love the scenic float. It's different times of year you'll you'll see different animals. The last float that I went on with one of my friends, we saw a moose. And we got really good views of up close of some beaver. And it's a really nice float trip. Your feet might get a little bit wet in the boat, but it's typically very calm water and very beautiful. Osprey, eagles, a lot of that kind of wildlife and small river. And then, of course, like a moose, we, we happened across a moose that night. So there's always animals around you in Grand Teton National Park. And it's also the Grand Teton is part of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So it's all part of that. So they have some of the same animals that you would see at Yellowstone from what I'm gathering. It's all part of the same kind of ecosystem. And Yellowstone is very close. So you could kind of do both parks if you wanted to and had the time. Yeah. And I want to say I was out there maybe like six years ago. There's an area called Hermitage Point. And I want to say they had that area closed down for hiking. And I it took me asking a couple of times to get people to finally start telling me that some of the wolves had come down from Yellowstone and had made a den out on Hermitage Point. So I don't know if they're still there, but there had been at one point in time, some of the wolves have migrated down into the Tetons from Yellowstone. So, And I don't know anything about what to do in wolf territory. Are there other special precautions like you do bear spray or do you use the same bear spray if you got yourself in a pickle? I think wolves are pretty typically pretty shy. You're not going to have any confrontations with the wolves. They're, they're pretty shy animals. All right. So we've talked about the hiking. We've talked about the path. Now you can float down the river or you can paddle or motorized boat in the 10 lakes, but you can also bike. They don't let you go on the trails. There's lots of great road biking. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So it seems like every time I go out there, there's more and more bike trails. Now the bike trails are out along the roads, which are kind of out more in the open flat areas. So you're going to have some areas that have some steeper rolling hills and there's not going to be any shade. So if it's a hot, hot summer day, there's no place for shade out there. But it's pretty awesome to ride your bike in front of the Tetons. (laughs) 
you have to plan ahead and make sure you pack along your own water and food and stuff like that. You might encounter, if you're biking early morning, you might encounter some of the bigger animals like deer or elk or pronghorn along the way. So just be aware of that and make sure you're looking ahead of you and being aware of your surroundings so that you don't accidentally ride your bike into a larger animal. But during the afternoons, it does get hot in the afternoons out on those main roads, and there is no place to pull off and get to shade. So just keep that in mind. But if you're a hardy biker, it's beautiful. Cool. They did say dehydration is one of the biggest problems they have out there because of the elevation. And I guess it's so dry out there that people do tend to get really dehydrated. So you always want to carry more water than you think you need. Yeah, absolutely. For those that like to horseback ride, I see you've got some ranches there. They can go out and horseback rides. I guess even bring your own horse if that's a possibility for you. But you can also go on one or two hour horseback rides. Have you ever done that? Or can you talk about that? Yep. That's always kind of been one of our family traditions. There's a chuck wagon ride where you ride horses for about an hour out to an area. They cook you dinner and you enjoy the scenery and enjoy the view. And then you get back on your horse and come back. Uh, That's one of my favorite things to do is to go out on the horses, have a meal out in the wilderness, and then pack up and then ride back in. So there's lots of options of different places. Most of the ones that I've done have been out of the the Grand Teton Lodge. Yeah, I think that's the one I'm going to be recommending in the travel planner as well, because they do the horseback rides and also the floating. And the floating trip also has a lunch dinner option as well, which sounds fun. Another one of my favorite family traditions is there's a breakfast cruise that you take a boat from Coulter Bay and go out to Elk Island and you eat your breakfast out on Elk Island. And there's these beautiful views because from that west side of the island, there's nothing between you and the mountains but water. So it's this big, beautiful view, and you can see all the way up and down the mountain range. So and they serve trout for breakfast. They serve Idaho trout for breakfast. And who doesn't love fresh trout for breakfast? (laughs) Sounds like fun. You'll have to include that picture when you send me some pictures, too. Okay. I'll put that on the website as well. Yeah. So we've covered hiking, biking, horseback riding, and rafting. Is there anything else that we should be talking about? Definitely one thing I would recommend to people is down at Teton Village, That's where the ski resort is. There are some trams that will take you from the base of the mountain up to some of the, I'll call them the lower, higher elevations. And they will give you these big, beautiful panoramic views down into the valley. So if you don't have the physical ability to get the elevation for these views, I would really recommend go down to Teton Village. There's one big tram. It's a little bit more expensive but you can spend as much time as you want to up there. And they do have some food up there. And one of the new things that I just did the last time I was there, there's a smaller tram that takes you up to really, really beautiful restaurant. And it's got a big deck on the front. It's called Pist Bistro, P-I-S-T-E. And there's a deck out there. And if it's a beautiful summer day, I think after five o'clock, It was either a reduced price or it was a free ride up there. And we took that up to the top and we sat in the fancy restaurant and ordered all this fun, fancy food and looked out over the valley and it was gorgeous and beautiful. But that's an opportunity to get at a higher elevation if you don't have the physical ability to hike to the 10,000 foot elevation. So consider those two that there, there are other ways to get up into the mountains without necessarily having to hike up there. That sounds like fun. That's a nice option. Yeah, it's neat. And then also, let's talk a little bit about accommodations. It looks like it runs the gamut. Sure. So if you're on a budget, I camped for a week down at Jenny Lake. I stopped in Jackson, picked up a week's worth of groceries, and I ate all my meals out of my campsite, which was very affordable. Kind of a medium range is there are some cabins and stuff up at at Coulter Bay. And then you can get into the higher price lodges. And if you stay down in Jackson, be ready to spend at least $200 a night for some place in Jackson. And you can spend even more than that. And some of the ski resort areas, they get a little bit expensive too. But the ranches are beautiful. If you can get into a ranch, they're a little bit more expensive, but it's a beautiful experience. And from what I've heard, the chefs at a lot of these ranches are really spectacular. So you can spend... You can do it on a shoestring budget, but just be ready to camp and bear out whatever kind of weather you have. Or you can go out there and 
spend lots and lots of money and have all the creature comforts. So it's definitely a variety. Right. And they do have about a thousand drive up to the campsites available. So that makes it easier if, if people don't want to backpack their junk further into the back country. They can just drive to the campsite, which is kind of yeah. nice. Yeah. So, and then let's talk a little bit about the town of Jackson Hole itself. It's a fun town. Yeah. Million dollar cowboy bar. That's always a good time. <laughs> I think that's where Venti took me. Yeah. That's always a good time. Yeah. There's a lot of nice places to in town. There's something always going on. I enjoy the farmer's market. They have a Saturday morning farmer's market. That was nice to go down and see that. If you're into a lot of different kinds of art, there's definitely any kind of Western art that you could ever think of is there in that town. The locals are very nice people. I got to meet some locals there a couple of years ago. I was with a friend who had gotten in an accident. So I spent a little time with her in town while she was recuperating. And we got to meet some locals and they are very nice people. Yeah, I found them to be very warm and accommodating when I went to visit Venti. And Venti, I might add, has traveled all over the world, probably been just about everywhere. And when she made it to Jackson Hole for the first time, she's like, okay, this is it. I'm home. I think she's Australian, right? I believe so. Yeah, I believe she's Australian, not British. But yeah, so she, after seeing almost every place in the world, Jackson Hole's where she chose to move. Any other bits of advice that people should know? One thing we forgot to talk about is the best times of year to go. Keep in mind that at the higher elevations, like if you're going to go do some of the higher passes and stuff, that some of that snow doesn't leave until early August. I've been out there twice in June and tried to go up Cascade Canyon up to Lake Solitude. It's been a goal of mine to see Lake Solitude. One time I went in June, yeah, I guess it, one was early June and one was late June. And both times we couldn't get up to the lake because there was still too much snow on the trails. So... Keep in mind, there's a very small window that even if you do get a permit to like go up and over the pass and camp up there, there might be so much snow that you can't even make it up there. So that's also why the, that particular section is always in high demand and you want to make your plan your trip six to nine months ahead of time is because there's always a very small window when that snow is gone from that area. So be careful when you get into the higher elevations. If you're out there in June and July, August is usually when the Everything has gotten melted off. And then, I mean, I've heard about people who've been up there in July and gotten snowed on. So you can, <laughs> it's the mountains and it's high elevations. So always pay attention to your weather. And it can be a little tricky too when you get up to the elevations. If you're hiking up into the mountains, always bring a rain jacket and always bring something warm to wear. The last time I was there, I got hailed on twice because these storms come over the mountains. You can't see them coming from the west. So always pay particular attention. Stop by, use your rangers. They have the information. Stop by your ranger stations and your visitor centers and question them about the weather because you do not want to get caught in bad weather up on top of the mountain. And you can't see the bad weather coming because the bad weather comes from the, the west and you are on the east side of the mountains. So yeah, definitely watch your weather. To me, anytime you go up an elevation, you ought to, even if you're not planning on it, be prepared to spend the night. You should have thermals. You should have a heat blanket. All the things that you need in case something goes wrong, you can spend the night in safety. Yeah. Yeah. Which I always get made fun of for overpacking for day hikes, but <laughs> right. It's like, well, I know I'm going to be warm tonight. I'm going to be warm and dry. I don't know about you. That's right. No, I can always spend the night when I go in the woods. I've learned my lesson from two sorry incidences that have scarred me. <laughs> so it's, so, but it doesn't keep me from going the mountains. It just makes me cautious and aware that the mountains, it's not Disneyland. Things can go wrong. So you need to be prepared to, the, I love your dog. You need to be prepared to take care of yourself. <laughs> and speaking of unexpectedly spending the night in the woods, I did on the new show, the Adventure Travel Show podcast, episode number two is on what to put in an emergency kit that you should keep in your pack. And also the how to pack your backpack includes some really helpful information too of the things that you should always have in your pack before you go into the woods. So I'll put links to those again in the show notes and on the website. Adding these items are only a couple of pounds, but they sure will come in handy if you find yourself in a bit of a pickle. Always make sure somebody knows where you're going so that if you don't get back at a reasonable time, they know where to start looking for you as well. And they've gotten better. The cell phone reception, I'll call it into the front range. So the cell phone reception, like at the base of the mountain, is usually pretty good. But then once you get back up to the canyons, then you start losing your cell phone reception. But it's there's been times that I've been amazing that it's like I hear my phone beep and I'm like, do I have reception out here? <laughs> so 
So it's gotten better out there that there's a lot more phone signal than there used to be there. Right. And you still can't count on it. No, definitely don't count on it. Yeah. Can't count on your cell phone. Work. Like when we were in Glacier, it never worked. Yeah. I mean, that, we were off the grid for days at a time before we could get a signal somewhere. Yeah. But most of the Tetons, until you get higher up into the mountains, most of the Tetons, you should have phone signal just about anywhere that you are. If there's one place, if we only have a limited number of time that we want to make sure that we go see while we're there, what would that be? If it's not crowded, I would definitely recommend swinging by Jenny Lake and walking along Jenny Lake for a little bit. I would definitely go up to the top of Signal Mountain. Signal Mountain is kind of over by where the dam is, where Jackson Lake drains. And you drive up this little little area and it gets you up and above. It's very mosquito-y, but it's beautiful. And it's one of my favorite places to drive up to in the morning. And then as the sun comes up and lights up the Tetons, it's really gorgeous pictures. And then if you want to see some one of the big older lodges, then you can also go up to Grand Teton Lodge. That's not too much farther north of there. Okay, there's my top three. <laughs> okay, any other, Dad, tell us one secret insider tip that only somebody that you that's been there many times would know. Oh, Leaks Marina has amazing pizza. If you go up, to, if you're looking for a quick bite to eat that's not overly expensive, go to Le- Leaks Marina if you're up in that area and, and go get some of their pizza. It's phenomenal. <laughs> now that's a good tip. Food is really important to all of us. <laughs> Any final piece of advice that you give anybody that's considering going out to the Tetons? I would definitely do research and narrow things down because there's so many options of, do you want to take a tour boat ride? Do you want to go rent your own boat? Do you want to bring your own kayaks? Do you want to go horseback riding? Do you want to hike? Do you want to hike at low elevations? You know, do you want to go whitewater rafting? Because there's so much stuff to do in this area, make sure you narrow it down before you get there so that you're not so overwhelmed with your options and then walk away later and say, oh, I wish I would have known about the scenic float trip because I would have loved to do that. So make sure you do your research ahead of time because there really is a ton, a ton, a ton of options out in the Tetons. There's great trails, there's great activities, and there's just a lot to do. And that's why you can go to this place over and over and over again and never do the same stuff twice. Nice, nice. And I'll have links to a lot of this in the travel planner that comes free with the monthly newsletter. So if you haven't signed up for that, I strongly recommend that you do. I don't spam you or sell your name. And just every month, you'll get the travel planners for whatever we covered the month before. And also, you can go to the website, activetraveladventures.com slash Tetons, and that's spelled T-E-T-O-N-S. And you can also get the information there. And you'll see Lorna's photos, and I'll probably have some videos and other photos there as well. Any other final thoughts, Lorna? No, it's a beautiful place. You should go visit it before the tourists ruin it. (laughs) Hopefully they'll never ruin it. I think that's what the controls are for. Well, thanks, Lorna, for your time. It's been great having you back on. We'll have to get you back on. You've been to, I don't know how many parks, so I'm sure we can have you on lots of times. Yeah, yeah. I think that last loop I did, I think I hit 30 total by the end. So, Wow. Well, it's good hearing your voice again. Yeah. Thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Lorna is another good example of what I keep talking about, how you meet some really cool people when you're out doing adventure travels. I met Lorna when I was in Glacier National Park with Venti, whom I met in France. So Venti and I became friends in France. And then the following summer, I flew to Jackson Hole where she lives. And from there, we went up to the Grand Tetons. En route, we stopped at her girlfriend Elle's whom she'd met on a whitewater rafting trip somewhere else. Els and I end up going to Bhutan together. The following summer, Lorna comes and spends a week with me. So it becomes this tangled up slinky of friendships that's just been so much fun. And it's been one of the highlights of this new passion of mine of doing this adventure travel. You just meet some cool people and you bond so quickly because you have this common interest of the love of the outdoors, whether it's through hiking or biking or paddling or whatever it is that you do. But I find that each trip I go on, I tend to make one new lifelong friend. And it's just amazing to me. It's part of one of my favorite things about going on these adventures. I hope you've enjoyed today's program. And I also have got all the links, especially looks like we used a lot of them for the new show, which I encourage you to subscribe to. And remember, podcasts, if you're not familiar with them, are free and subscriptions are free. So you can go to any podcast app and look for Adventure Travel Show. So it's the Adventure Travel Show podcast. And hit the subscribe button. And please share this 
episode and the new show with your friends is the best way for people to find out about new podcasts. I sure would appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time. Until then, this is Kit Parks. Adventure on. Adventure on.